welcome to the A-List. I'm Stacia Morales, and joining me on this edition is the Assistant Curator of the Museum of Science and Industry, Mr. Stephen Rosengard. Hello, Mr. Rosengard, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So, what does it mean to be a curator? Oh, well, I think that varies a lot from museum to museum, but um, in our case, it's uh, the job to take care of uh, the artifacts and make sure that they're in a temperature and humidity controlled environment and all that sort of thing. And also sometimes interpret the artifacts in such a way so that they can go out on the floor and become, you know, the stories that you know as exhibits. And does it take a long time to make a story into an exhibit? Oh, a horrible amount of time, um, depending on, you know, what you're working with, so on and so forth. But yes, uh, usually you work night and day for as long as you possibly can until um, you fall over or it's the date that's been set for the exhibit opening. So uh, yeah, it's kind of tricky that way. You just have to keep on going until you can't go anymore. So let's work backwards. How did you go to becoming a curator? Did you go to college for it? Actually, uh, no, I didn't, um, which I suppose would kind of make some other people who are looking for curatorial jobs kind of mad, truth be told. Um, but no, I uh, had started off as the secretary in between temporary exhibits and uh, collections. And then um, as time went on, you know, I kind of moved up a little bit and uh, became the textile preparator because um, I was familiar with sewing techniques and that sort of thing. And then I ended up moving down uh, to the collections department full time uh, about five or six years ago and been there ever since down in the basement, so. Is sewing a hobby of yours? Um, well, yeah, I kind of started off when I was maybe 11 or 10, I think. Um, because uh, I just started when I realized that uh, my Barbie dolls needed more clothes than we could possibly afford to buy. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Um, so I ended up uh, learning how to sew just kind of in self-defense, I guess you'd say. And then I got bored with the dolls and I thought, wait, what's the next best thing? People, and people can pay you to sew. The dolls can't, which is really depressing. Um, yes, it's especially depressing. for all the hours I worked for those girls. All those Barbies. Exactly, exactly. Um, but uh, so yeah, then I started uh, sewing for people in high school, and uh, you know, and then I took a few years off of it, and because I got kind of burnt out, because that's just what happens with design, and then um, about seven, eight years ago, I thought, mm, I need to get back into it. And I did, until about a couple of years ago when I got totally out of it again. So it's a cyclical thing, you know, you just, you can't stay in it forever unless you want to totally burn yourself out or you've got several great assistants. So you went from secretary to textile and then you became a curator. How long was it from textile to curator? Oh, probably just a couple of years. Um, but see, uh, MSI is different from probably a lot of other museums that you know, like the Field Museum, for example. Uh, they have, or you know, from what I've heard, they had, you know, maybe up to forty different curators. At MSI, we have three for the entire, you know, six hundred thousand square feet of exhibit space which is kind of challenging to only have three of us. Um, but, you know, um, at the same time, we have other positions like exhibit developers and so on, and designers and so on and so forth, which a lot of other museums don't have. So that kind of takes off a lot of the workload from us. So it's not nearly as bad as, you know, it might sound. But at the same time, we don't necessarily have the specialties, you know, where you know we might be just in mammals, you know, or just in fish, or just in, you know, I don't know, or just things, uh, or only textiles. So, yeah, if someone calls up about biology one moment and then offers us a plane the next moment and then says, "Oh, by the way, what do you think about this rock?" Yeah, we're there for all of it. <laughs> so. 
So, uh, do you all do you, the three of you just like separate different areas of the museum, or is it just here's this, here's that? Oh no, no, it's just like whoever happens to be sitting there and stupid enough to pick up the phone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, God help you if you ever pick up your phone, um, at, because you never know what's going to be there when you uh, answer the phone. It. It may be a, someone saying, you know what, I've got this Boeing 747 or 727 or whatever. And at which point you get to say, you know what, um, thank you, but we already have one. You know, or, you know, sometimes people will call up and say, I think I've got an asteroid that landed in my backyard. No, I, I'm actually, <laughs> I should say, I get that call once a week. And I would love to tell people to quit calling me about their asteroids. Call, you know, I don't know, the Adler. I don't know, because um, that's where we send them all anyway. So I feel so sorry for those people at the Adler. But um, yeah, we, you just never know. Never know. Just out of curiosity, what is it usually when they say they have an asteroid? Just a really big rock? I don't know. I never actually see, the, I never actually, uh, see them. I send them all to the Adler, seriously, and, which is why there must be such a high turnover over at the Adler. I can only imagine the phone calls that those poor people get. But there again, you know, at the History Museum, I guess they have uh, something that they had to uh, take an accession because uh, one donor had given them a whole bunch of other stuff. And he said, you know, I've also got a snake skin from the serpent from the Garden of Eden. <laughs> You've gotten that call? Oh, no, 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 this was something that was given to the uh, Chicago History Museum. You know, this man was convinced it was the skin of the snake from the Garden of Eden. And was just like, well, all right, how are we going to enter this one in the book? The snake skin, Garden of Eden, got it. The next was, you know, and they just had to sit there and take it. It's just one of those curiosity things, but. So what's the strangest call that you have ever received? Oh. Oh wow, the, the absolute worst one um, was a woman uh, who called up absolutely sobbing and uh, was just wrecked. Her mother had just died the week before. Oh. And um, she said, you know, um, I need the names of all of the babies in your, uh, in your baby exhibit, which is actually our prenatal exhibit, which is part of our new uh, you the exhibit, um, and it said, um, I, 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 uh, <laughs> why? <laughs> and she said, um, well, uh, my mother told me on her deathbed um, that uh, what if, that my sister was actually in 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 your exhibit, and I need the names of all the babies in the exhibit. I, oh my that God. was exactly my reaction, and I'm thinking, oh dear God, could this possibly be true? And then I thought, wait a second. I went, okay, fingers crossed. What year was your mother born? 1941? <laughs> All the... Uh, uh, fetuses have been collected between, I believe, 1927 and 1932 and been shown at the World's Fair in 1933-34. And so because her mother had been born after all of these uh, fetuses, there was no way she had given birth to one of them. And after that phone, I think I just crawled under my desk and just, <laughs> I can't remember if I laughed or cried or a little combo platter of both, but oh, it was I'm just sorry. a little overwhelming. <laughs> I'm not trying to laugh because it's sad that her mother died. Oh, just no, no, the no. Whole oh, no, the whole <laughs> premise of it. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, call up, I think you've got one of my siblings in your cases. Oh, how dreadful. God, what awful people we must be to go and put people's <laughs> children in cases. I mean, you know, it, uh, you know, what do you do with that? I don't know. Um, Oh, that's right. You just crawl under your desk and, you know, giggle and cry, I guess. Yeah. Until I come up with something more efficient, you know, that's going to be my advice. If you ever get that call yourself, under the desk, giggle and cry. I don't know. I, as you can see, I'm hard at keeping my face straight. So I don't know what I do with that call. 
I'd probably be called very rude. Oh, no, no, no. Wait until you've got someone actually, you know, near, near uh, just tears. Actually, the woman was, you know, in between sobs. Hello. Um, I need your help uh, getting the names of all of the babies <laughs> in the exhibit. I'm just like, oh, dear God, no, why? No, because I know those, I know none of the fetuses have the names, and I'm just like, are we going to have to start naming them? But actually, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no. What do you do? What do you do? I have no idea. I would probably hope that there were some kind of file or oh, location where oh, I could no, look there, that there, up. there are, of course, files, but I mean. I wouldn't the, know if the, you named a fetus the, or not. Well, no. well, actually, we only did name the last one. Can I even tell you that? I don't think I can. <laughs> I don't. I'm, well, no, we just had to. No, we had to just. Well, just because he was so cute, you know, and he actually looked like a normal baby because it was the full term one, so we kind of named him Tate because he looked like a tater. So I don't know. I, I, what? We had worked like 12 hours that day. We were really tired. <laughs> don't look at me like that. <laughs> so did you work on the prenatal exhibit? Oh, on you, the exhibit, yes, on uh, Science Storms, which is, you know, the one that everyone knows is having the big indoor tornado. Uh, worked on that one for many, many, many months. And, um, you know, everything from the Christmas Around the World exhibit. Um, I'm one of those two guys that you see every year, though about hmm, three, four weeks before Christmas, or before Thanksgiving, I should say up in the cherry pickers, you know, hanging on for dear life, <laughs> you know, trying not to get electrocuted and, um, you know, trying to hang lights on the tree. Um, yeah, that's, that's me. I'm actually the more scared looking of the two, if you can't really tell. Um, and my coworker, Jeff, would be the other one uh, who's, you know, probably banging his lift into the tree, um, thereby, thereby uh, giving me vertigo and, uh, you know, you'll see me just hanging onto a branch back and forth and back and forth. Um, yeah, it's, it's a treat. Um, but we've been doing it uh, for probably, I think, 11 or 12 Christmases now. Um, and it's, it's just kind of a tradition that we, you know, scare the living daylights out of each other that way. Well, friends have ways of showing they care. Oh, exactly. Scaring exactly. you half to death is just one of the many. You know. And for all I know, you know, that woman who called about, you know, the baby, you know, being, you know, her sibling, that was probably one of his, you know, friends from college for all I know. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> Are you working on any new exhibits? Yes, actually, uh, we're working on 80 at 80, which is um, 80 artifacts for our 80th anniversary. Um, and it's all, of course, uh, geared to show the things from the past that have inspired, you know, exhibits that have occurred in the more recent past and also the ones that are presently out. Um, but we also have a number of objects that we're acquiring just for the exhibit, including uh, a camera phone that's uh, been designed completely by Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas. Uh, you just drop in your iPhone and all of a sudden, uh, it becomes a 16 megapixel camera and, you know, takes video of really high quality and the whole nine yards. So it's, it's really kind of amazing. And then uh, we're also going to get a drone, you know, drone. yes, a uh, flying robot that, you know, takes oh. video and all this sort of other scary stuff, you know, you know, stuff that George Orwell was probably sitting here going, it's going to happen. Watch out. <laughs> I'm warning you. You know, yes, it's, yeah, the future is here and it is scary. Uh, we're also getting a LiDAR, uh, one of those things that goes on top of a Google car, uh, which allows unmanned vehicles to actually drive along the road and not crash into each other. So, yeah, lots of exciting stuff. It should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. And that opens June 19th, so you should check it out. Cool. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun, and that's all that we have time for today. Thank you for joining me on the A-List. I'm Stacia Morales. Have a good evening. <laughs>